All right. Good morning, everyone. Today is Sunday, October the 4th, 2020, and we are gathered here virtually in Zoom to continue our Sunday School class, Curiosity and Questions, Jesus and Science. Today, we're going to be taking a look at a, what's actually a very short chapter, chapter three of John Lennox's book, 2084, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity, uh, and it's called The Second Big Question, Where are we going? His first question was, where did we come from? So today we're going to be talking a little bit about perhaps the trajectory of technology and artificial intelligence. And, and the big question, I'll just throw it out there, is going to be thinking about uh, where we're going and, and where we should go, or if there are places maybe we shouldn't go uh, with all of this. So today I want to actually share announcements first. Oh, did I get that out of order? No, I don't think I did. Announcements first. We'll pray. Um, I'm going to share actually a couple current events, which are pretty interesting, so that some of which touch on AI and others just talk, touch on, you know, discoveries in the universe and the, ad, and the march of science and, um, you know, things that I think can help us, you know, even deepen further our awe of God and our creation and those kinds of things. And then we'll read our Bible verse um, and we're going to do joys and concerns before the lesson. Next week uh, is actually our fall break at Cassidy. And so we will not have a live lesson, but I will be recording a lesson. And in all likelihood, it may be a continuation of this lesson because um, I have like 30 something slides and I, 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 joys and concerns is a super important part of what we do. And so um, I want to hopefully, well, I want to spend more time on that this time than we even do with the lesson. So I'm going to record a lesson that I will be sending you before next Sunday, uh, if you would like to check it out. And I anticipate it's probably going to be a continuation. So a couple announcements. Um, I really think that for, for now, at least, as I kind of check out the communications channels our church uses, our newsletter that is inside our mobile app called First Look may be the best place to kind of get a, a deep dive or a comprehensive look into the life of the church. So there is an October edition of that. If you open up that app on your smartphone or on your tablet, you can go to that. And I was excited. And we haven't attended church yet. We're, we, we go to the, the late service. And maybe this is an announcement there. Uh, but they're going to have an exciting weekend event that's going to be called the Footsteps of Jesus Weekend Experience. And that's going to come up on November 6th and 7th. And so uh, Bob uh, Roglin, who has led trips with, for members of our church to the Holy Land, and Eric has, I think, been been uh, apprenticed by in, in his journeys to the Holy Land and, and leadership is going to come back and lead us through uh, this, this weekend journey through the life of Jesus, thinking about biblical archaeology and uh, the, the life of Christ. So that, that looks exciting. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we won't have a live class next week, but I will be sending you I will be sending you a video. So and I'll also uh, send you the link. I've been been able to post the recordings of our classes after um, after class and you know Sunday afternoons, and I'm going to try to kind of keep up that schedule. I'll send you a link to to this Padlet wall, which is just a place to be able to to post joys and concerns. So it is private. Um, it's not a link that's that's out there anywhere else besides in our group, and so that's a way for us to continue lifting each other up in prayer, and also being able perhaps to follow up on things in terms of what what kinds of things we've lifted up in prayer before and to kind of just touch base with people and see, uh, you know, what, what's going on now and, and how things are going. So this is a bit of a fuzzy picture, but I took this, I think it was Wednesday morning at our school. Um, I had to get there early. Maybe it was on Friday actually, because that's Friday. Yeah. Friday was the day I had to get there earlier for school. So this was, this was Friday morning with that full moon. I don't know if you've been watching the sunsets, just amazing. And I think it's because of so many fires in the Western part of the United States. And then we not only had this amazing, you know, orange orb setting in the West, but then this amazing full moon, you know, rising in the East. And so this is, it's actually in the East here, because it's about to set, the sun's about to come up, but this was, this was just beautiful. And, you know, that, that's one of the things that we read in the Bible that, you know, God's majesty and his power is visible for all to see. And anyway, I had that kind of feeling as I was looking up at this amazing moon, which this picture doesn't really do justice to, because you, it's kind of hard to get a good picture of, of the moon, unless I guess you have a telescope. So let's open up with a word of prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your majestic creation, God, and the fact that you have placed us here on this planet at this time, the ways that you have knit us, Lord, that you have created us, um, the ways that you walk with us, Lord. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who you sent so that we could understand and know the ways that we are to live, Lord, the ways we're to treat each other and the the spirit that we are to have inside our heart as we, we go about our lives. We thank you for the members of this class, for our church congregation, for the community that we live in here in Oklahoma. And God, I pray that you would open up our eyes and our ears to hear the message that you have for us, Lord. I pray that I would step away as we open up your scripture and we consider many things today. And, and God, we would hear from you and that we would be open to your Holy Spirit. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so a couple current events. Um, you know, I teach fifth and sixth grade students at Cassidy. Uh, this year I'm teaching Spanish, <laughs> which is uh, something we're needing for the pandemic just to reduce our class sizes. And so that has been uh, both a challenge and a, and a fun opportunity. My normal classes to teach are media literacy classes, um, which some people would call computer classes. And one of the things I've been en encouraging my students to check out is Google News because there are so many different places that we get information from today. It's kind of amazing, even though they're not 13, probably about a third of my, of my fifth graders are on TikTok, you know, and a lot of that is dancing videos and things that aren't having to do with news, but there's a lot of different places where we get news. And so this is just one place that I've, I've been encouraging my kids to look. And so if you would go to Google News today and put in the words, um, uh, black hole discovery, um, they have this thing called full coverage, and it has links from lots and lots of different websites, but they're all journalistic, you know, websites. They're not somebody's garage and, and somebody who's just publishing a website that looks really slick, but doesn't, you know, have any legitimacy. And so I heard about this this last week, and we talked a lot last year in our class, and I anticipate we still are going to keep this focus. That's why I wanted to, to share a couple of current events along these lines about how the more we get to see out in the universe with telescopes and different technologies, with, with spacecraft that you know, venture out. And then also the, the more we see the not just microscopic, but the, the stuff we can't even see with a microscope, you know, the, the uh, tiny, tiny uh, organic materials, DNA, the, the things that we're stitched together with, it is incredible how complex the universe and the world is. And I think we can really, you know, deepen our, our awe of God and, and, and just our worship of him because what an incredible world he has created. So one of the articles that's linked there in that whole collection of different ones um, is from, I think, three days ago. This is the New York Times. And the headline is, At the Edge of Time, A Litter of Galactic Puppies. And the subtitle is, The Discovery of a Black Hole Surrounded by Proto-Galaxies Provides Astronomers with a Rare Glimpse of the Web of Matter Permeating the Cosmos. And so I'll read you just a little bit of this. Uh, this is from October 1st. Astronomers announced Thursday they had discovered a giant black hole surrounded by a litter of young proto-galaxies that date to the early universe, the beginning of time. The black hole, and I won't try to read you the number numeric name, uh, but it powers a quasar. It has this long name. Think about this. A solar mass is the, is the mass of one of our suns. This black hole weighs in at a billion solar masses when the universe was only 900 million years old, it and its brood, the astronomer said, represented the infant core of what became a vast cluster of galaxies, millions of light years across, and encompassing a trillion suns worth of matter. And if you've ever seen, usually when we look at like these little, you know, um, models of the solar system, they are totally not to scale. You know, the sun is so huge and the distance out to, you know, I guess Pluto is now not considered a planet, uh, but, you know, out to uh, Neptune and just, they're so, so enormous. When I was teaching fourth grade in Lubbock, Texas, is where I started my, my teaching career, we uh, got a bunch of yarn and went outside to the playground and, and I, did the math, of course, for our kids, but then they measured, and we, we, were, we were 
doing a relative distance, you know, with yarn, how, how big, you know, and the inner solar system is this tiny, tiny thing. And, you know, it's just incredible. So these are numbers, you know, kind of like maybe our budget for our country or, or whatever, debts and deficits. You know, we can't even hardly fathom these numbers are so big. They go on, this discovery should help astronomers understand the origins of galactic clusters, the largest structures in the universe, and how supermassive black holes could have grown so quickly in the early universe. And it provides a rare glimpse of the cosmic web, a network of filaments spanning the cosmos that determine the large scale distribution of matter in the universe. And I won't read the rest of it, but I'll, I've sent you a link to these, the, the slides um, and you can click on the link there if you wanna you know, read that a little further. The article says that some of this is controversial in terms of the mapping and, and the ways in which we believe you know, the, 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 uh, the orientation of, of galaxies and, and the universe is. One of the things that I'm struck by, you know, reading this is just how incredible, like how limited our, our knowledge still is, how incredible the universe is, and how important it is to keep some humility. Because one of the things we talked about last year that I believe is a mistake is some people think that as science advances, religion and faith has to retreat, you know, that it's a zero sum. And the more things that we have names for, sort of the, the, the smaller God is. And one of our authors talked about that as a God in the gaps approach to faith, you know, that if you are just believing that the mystery that we don't have scientific explanations for is God, you know, then, then God would get smaller and smaller. But I don't believe that's the perspective that we have as Christians, as Presbyterians, and followers of Jesus. And, and, and this is just pretty amazing. This was a long study this, uh, that, that was just published. Um, and uh, it, it begs a question, you know, what is a quasar? <laughs> uh, and a quasar is, a, 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 according to Wikipedia, an extremely luminous active galactic nucleus. So the center of a nucleus that has a supermassive black hole. We believe there's a black hole in the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And of course, our Milky Way galaxy, which has a lot of solar systems uh, and suns, and we believe exoplanets, you know, surrounding it is, um, you know, is gigantic. But this, what we're talking about in terms of this discovery is, is vastly larger. And so here's just one more quotation from it, uh, thinking about, you know, time and thinking about distance. Uh, this is the quasar um, that they measured. And it says that the light waves from it, um, the size of the whole universe has been stretched by a factor of over seven. And basically, and because the further we look back into space, the, the, the farther we're looking back into time, it corresponds to when the universe was 900 million years old. And that means it took 12.9 billion years for the light that we're seeing today to reach Earth, making it one of the most distant quasars ever discovered. I think that is just absolutely stunning and phenomenal. And so uh, that kind of leads into what we're going to talk about as far as our, our verse for today. The, the next current event I want to share briefly, actually there's two, one of them is pretty current, the other one's about a year old, has to do with artificial intelligence. And we're talking about AI and where we're going with these technologies and how it's impacting us and, you know, kind of the trajectory of are we, are we going to, to good places? Do we want to think about, you know, the ethics and morality of what we're doing and we should do with all this? And so this is an article from the MIT Technology Review last week on September 25th. And there have been artificial intelligence engines that have done things like, you know, played chess and beat chess champions, now played Go and beat the world's top champion of Go, which is the most complicated uh, game basically ever, I think, created. Um, and we've had AI systems that have been writing text, and I'm gonna show an, share an article about this, but this new one is that these AI models are learning to draw and to generate images based upon captions. And like this is really early days, right? But the idea that algorithms which are not fixed. In other words, when I'm teaching my kids, as I am now in Spanish class, how to make little characters animate and, and have a, a speech bubble and then say their words, they're, they're, we're doing little dialogues, like that program doesn't change unless they change it. But these AI programs continue to learn and they continue to get better. And so this, these are weird, 
but it's a glimpse into where this is going with algorithms that can learn and get better and are actually able to create visualizations. So a couple, uh, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, in February of 2019, there was this article talking about, um, the title was OpenAI won't release the AI text generator branding it too dangerous. Different groups are making these AI projects and this one was generating text that was so real and so realistic that the, the, the creators of it decided it's just too dangerous to put it out there because what would this, what would people do with this if they wanted to, you know, use it to manipulate the public, to, you know, throw an election, to sow disinformation. And, and, and it's just, it's just pretty incredible. There's something called the Turing test. Alan Turing was an early computer scientist and the Turing test as I understand it, is basically, you know, can you trick a human? Can you interact with a program enough to where as a person, you think you're interacting with another person? And so that kind of capability um, in some contexts, some, some people would say we've, we've met the Turing test with the, the, the programs and algorithms. So why don't we open up the Bible and read a verse? And this is one that, that for me is especially inspired by those, those earlier current events about the discoveries of the universe, but this is from Romans 11, verses 33 through 36, and I'm going to read from the NIV, and when I was looking at, at some of those pictures and thinking about quasars, you know, I love Michael W. Smith, and his is a wonderful song, Our God is an Awesome God. I'm not going to play that, but, um, you know, that those were some of the lyrics and the words that came to my mind. And this is what the Apostle Paul wrote in the 11th chapter of Romans, which is subtitled in the NIV, the doxology. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So we will consider those words as we, as we uh, dive into our lesson. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording. Zoom recording. And I think I successfully shared the wrong screen. So let me, let me stop this unless we want to learn about lesson casting, um, which is something we've been doing for school, and I'll try this again. All right, so I'm sure no one else has the problem of too many windows that are open on your computer at times. All right, there we go, joys and concerns. So here's our big question today, and um, like I said, this chapter that we're looking at today is chapter three, talking about where we're going, and the big question of, of chapter two was where did we come from, and so uh, this is our question that, that I'm going to invite you to, to talk about here in just a, a little bit with uh, breakout groups it is going to be, you know, where is all this, where is all this seem to go? And do you think we want to try and, and shape where this is going? It's a really big question because some people sort of see the march of technology as just inevitable. This is all just happening. There's really nothing we can do about it. And then there's others who are saying, you know, wait a minute, we definitely can, can choose uh, whether or not we are going to allow and endorse these things. It doesn't mean we're going to stop everything, but, you know, think about chemical weapons, you know, after World War I and the international treaties um, that we've had to try and, and stop countries from producing and distributing and using chemical weapons. Uh, think about torture, you know, the conventions that we have in the United Nations to try and protect people's rights and prohibit torture and, you know, make sure that both military forces and, and security police forces, you know, don't don't utilize torture as they seek to, you know, try to keep keep people safe. Um, so when it comes to, to to technology, to biotechnology, and the rapid advance of this, you know, things things are moving quite quickly. Um, and so that that's our question: where where are we going? And uh, you know, should we should we try and shape the trajectory of where we're going? So the quotation that the chapter begins with is a Yogi Berra quotation. My dad loves Yogi Berra quotations. Uh, and, and Yogi said, I guess, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. I like William Gibson's quotation 
and I've shared this multiple times, where he said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And that we can glimpse where we're headed with many things. It's just that these are just, you know, not, not necessarily pervasive where everybody is seeing this, everyone is experiencing it. But there are pieces of the future that, that we, can, we can already glimpse and we can experience. So one of the people that um, Lennox talks about in this chapter that is a really important person to know about in the whole realm of artificial intelligence is this fellow, Ray Kurzweil. And just raise your hand if you've ever heard of Kurzweil before. Um, he is an, an author. He works for Google now, actually. He has for a number of years. But one of his most famous books is called The Singularity is Near. And what he says in this book is that in the next few decades, not like a century away, but you know, in the, in the maybe 20 to 30 year time frame, artificial intelligence robots are going to exceed the capacity of human beings in their cognitive capabilities. And this is something we, I think I talked about last time, or maybe it was the, the lesson before when we did chapter two. There's, there's the idea of, 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 special, of specific artificial intelligence and then general. And Kurzweil is talking about general AI, not just like playing chess or playing Go or a robot being able to put together, you know, a, a, a car part, you know, in a better way or whatever, in a faster way than humans can, but literally the whole cognitive capacity of, of human beings. And so we are having an intelligence explosion today. And Kurzweil is one of several people who really believes that this is going to fundamentally change uh, as he says, the nature of mortality in a post-biological future. I don't know if you realize this, but there's folks that have, like, like millionaires who have paid to, they've died. But, but in their will, they said, I want my body to be cryogenically frozen because as I've studied the trajectory of technology, I believe I will be able to be brought back to life. And like, this is a real thing. This isn't like, you know, Frankenstein reading a Mary Shelley book or something. This is stuff people have really done. And some people really believe that we are going to not just be able to, you know, extend human life uh, a few more years and push it out, but that we're just going to have some, what we would might consider godlike powers over, you know, the duration of human life and, and over mortality. And so uh, Kurzweil is a really important person to know about. Um, there's a distinction that uh, Linux talks about in this chapter between the enhancement of human beings, what is called transhumanism, and then this idea of, um, you know, creating life of having a, a transcendent agent or, or entity that is going to be, you know, surpassing human capability. And transhumanism, uh, which is defined, he defines it as the intellectual and cultural movement that affirms the possibility and desirability of fundamentally improving the human condition, basically through science. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we see that. And so even in like prosthetics, uh, which generally I don't think many of us are going to be like, oh man, that's really controversial. No, it's great. You know, you were born without a limb, you lost a limb because of an accident, or maybe you're a veteran uh, and, and, you know, roadside bomb, um, you know, the ways in which folks who are paralyzed are able now with their mind alone to be able to communicate, to control a cursor. Um, there's a, a video and, and I might, I may include this one in, in the video for next week week that I'll record. It's incredible because if you think about prosthetics, you know, whatever, Captain Hook maybe from, uh, you know, Disney times, hooks have been, you know, used for um, probably centuries for, for people who have lost hands. But the way in which now there are brain interfaces to allow people with their brain so that it can connect to, to neurons and they can have individual agency over separate digits in terms of being able to grasp and do things, it is incredible. We're still, I believe, at, a, at somewhat of an early day with that. But the speed at which this is improving, um, it's interesting because there's some examples like that that, like I said, I don't think many people would, would question the ethics of that. They'd say, yes, that is fantastic. But then there's other stuff that really that kind of gets into another realm. And so how many of you have heard of this guy, Neil Harbison? Anybody heard of this guy? He is the first recognized 
cyborg. He's the first person in history to have an antenna implanted into his skull. And he lives in Ireland and the government has recognized him as a cyborg. And so his journey of, of, of implanting this antenna, he is, he is colorblind. And so um, he is able with this implant to not only see colors, but he's able to see parts of the electromagnetic spectrum in the infrared area and the ultraviolet that we can't see. You know, if you've studied honeybees, I think honeybees, right, are able to, to see these other parts of the spectrum. And, and, you know, we have night vision goggles that, you know, soldiers and hunters will use, you know, at times and, and probably security forces to see things that we can't visibly see. But he's also able to receive phone calls, music. He has a, this is a Wi-Fi enabled antenna. He can receive satellite data. <laughs> and then I've mentioned before this Neuralink project that Elon Musk is working on, which is, is, which is an interface. I think a, a week or two ago, I showed you an article, and I don't know if I, it just had pictures of the videos, but they've been doing this with pigs and, try, and being able to have a, a communication device that is able to not only receive things and pick up signals, but then also transmit signals directly into an, a, a biological brain, all right? This is, a, this is a quotation that, that should trouble us and, and, and certainly give us pause as Christians. Um, Elon Musk is famous for saying he believes artificial intelligence is, quote, summoning the demon. <laughs> and Musk is not the only person who is super concerned about this trajectory. Three of the people who are sort of the biggest um, well-known uh, authors and, and business leaders who have issued a call of worry and concern are Elon Musk, who is the CEO of Tesla and SpaceX. Um, we're going to talk about, um, I may have to go to the next slide to remember his name. Yeah, we're going to talk about Stephen Hawking in just a minute. Uh, Stephen Hawking is, uh, has passed away, but he is one of the most famous astrophysicists in the world, uh, an acknowledged atheist, but also Bill Gates the former CEO of, of Microsoft for many years, the, the richest person in the world. He was eclipsed by Jeff Bezos of Amazon, you know, a few, a few years ago. These folks are saying we need to be concerned about this and we need to take action about this. And the highlight there at the bottom um, is, is a paraphrase of what they and many AI researchers say is that we have a duty to ensure that the future impact of these technologies is beneficial rather than destructive, rather than you know, harmful. So Hawking um, has you know, wrote, wrote a lot trying to bring some of the, the discoveries of astrophysics and um, you know, theories of, from, from Einstein and relativity to you know, the cosmos and understanding the world. There is a book that was, that was po published posthumously after his death called Brief Answers to Big Questions. And some of his concerns about AI are included in there, including this. And he says, the real risk with AI isn't m malice, but competence. A super intelligent AI would be extremely good at accomplishing its goals. And if those goals aren't aligned with ours, we're in trouble. And so um, uh, our author says, shades of George Orwell. Um, I will admit to you that as of this lesson today, I have not fully read Orwell's 1984 or another book that I've mentioned called Brave New World. And so I want to have, these are both, um, you know, older books, but they touch on issues of surveillance and an omniscient state and the, the really some people would consider them to be a bit prophetic of the world that we've moved into. So on our website, uh, where I'm you know, posting our recordings and everything, followjesus.westfriar.com, um, I have posted both of these books. And it's interesting, Brave New World was by Huxley was in 1932. So it's passed out of copyright in all countries in the world. And you can download it in various forms for free. You don't have to buy it. You can. It's for sale on Amazon, but you don't have to buy it. Um, Orwell's works are out of copyright in Australia, but not here in the States. So you can view it free from a Project Gutenberg website in Australia, but it's for sale for a dollar on Amazon. Anyway, I've started to read Brave New World, and that's going to kind of inform some of my, my thinking, and I would want to commend, I think, both of those books to you, because these are books that keep coming up as we are hearing about um, these topics. 
uh, the, again, this is the suggestion of, of these AI uh, experts that m perhaps human intelligence is going to is going to be uh, outstripped. Uh, but but some people say that actually misunderstands what human intelligence is. And there is some hype over this, just as we always see with the media over people saying, you know, be scared, be, be very, very scared. So thinking about upgrading humanity is a side of this, you know, should there be a boundary for upgrading humanity? Uh, that can be, you know, parent, you know, does, would be or, or want to be parents who are taking a look at, you know, sperm and uh, egg and, and whether they should be picking an embryo and deciding, man, yeah, I'd really like to, you know, I want a really tall uh, blonde girl who's going to be a great volleyball player. Um, can, can we do that, doctor? Um, is there a boundary there where, where we've, we've left the, the reservation of, of morality and now we're we're off the reservation. Uh, how about military, you know, producing uh, super, super soldiers. Uh, we've, but many of us have probably seen Avatar and there's augmentation in, in the movie Avatar that the, the army soldiers have of being able to step into these uh, body suits that are huge and being able to fight inside them. But that's not the limit of what's being done and people are talking about and may already be experimenting in. It's also, you know, doing some genetic modifications and some biological modifications to try to make people, you know, into super soldiers that, that might be unstoppable. Um, so here are the questions that are posed at the end of the chapter. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and um, pause our recording here in a second and send us into breakout rooms for you to talk for just a little bit, and then I'll, I'll close this up. Um, the questions that Linux poses are, what does it mean to be human? In what sense will technology change what it means to be human? What are the ethical norms that should be applied here? And basically, should we give rights to these artificial intelligence agents? Are they, are they going to have human rights like we do? Um, how will these advances affect the way in which people think about God, whether they're believers or unbelievers? And is the future really much brighter than you imagine? So if you'd like to tackle any of those questions or just think about uh, where we're going and where we should go with AI, um, any of those things would be great to talk about. I'm going to go ahead and pause our recording, or actually I'm going to pause it and I'll stop it. And I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to just put us into two breakout rooms and invite you so there should be about four of us in each room invite you to tackle any of those questions or responding to any of those thoughts that that you would like to so the breakout rooms are open and i will bring us back here in about seven minutes or so to wrap up with prayer but you'll need to click join the breakout room Yeah. Um, we were watching a thing about Stephen Hawking, and I wondered how he commu I didn't understand how he was able to communicate. Has that been uh, that that uh, way of? Um, I think it was with something attached to his throat that was able to take the vibrations of his vocal cords and then oh. make make a computer voice of that. Mm -hmm. I think, but we can look at Well, I don't know. I wonder, I think it has something to do with the keyboard. I, I know at the beginning they said it was the keyboard and he was yeah. just able to.